Yeah. The talk is not your father's tests, uh, advanced testing patterns in Java, and a little bit of Scala also. My name is Sean Floyd. I work for Zolando. We have a booth out there. Um, come and talk to us after the talk. Um, yeah, I've, I have experience in several languages, mostly in Java, but a bit in, in Scala also, and I'm on Stack Overflow. Uh, this is what I plan to talk about. Um, software design principles and how they apply to tests. Specifically, JUnit best practices, and those are using matchers, mocking, extending the JUnit lifecycle, and at some point we actually want to look at Scala, and um, this is where we'll talk about testing in Scala. And finally, there's a cra the crazy part, which I call testing the untestable. Um, so, um, looking at situations where people would immediately say, I can't test this, but we'll try to test it anyway. So, software design principles. Um, there's lots of different software design principles. You gotta pick one. There's lots of them are good. I went for the solid principles for the, uh, this. The solid principles are um, there's the single responsibility principle, the open close principle, the Liskov substitution principle. I'll go into those. Um, there's the interface segregation principle and the dependency inversion principle, and the starting letters of these form the word solid. And they were introduced by Michael Feathers and uh, Uncle Bob in the year 2003. So if we go into those principles, um, the single responsibility principle says that one class should only have a single responsibility. And that, of course, also applies to test classes. Um, the problem is um, production classes basically have uh, three different, different levels. You have the class level, you have the method level, and you have the input to the, uh, to the uh, method as a level. And you actually want to test all three of them. Um, the, um, but uh, JUnit only gives you two levels of uh, abstractions. It gives you the test class and it gives you the test method. And there's different ways uh, to, to deal with that. Um, so purists, so some people would, would say, okay, I have one test method per production method. Others would say I have one test class per production method or there's various combinations thereof. At least that, that's something that, that we need to, uh, we need to uh, think of. Just having one test class per production, uh, one test method per production method is probably not good enough. Um, because only one type of change should should break any given test. So, um, um, because that's an analogy to to this uh, this principle. Only one kind of change in a software specification should be uh, able to affect the specification of a class, and that applies to a, to a test class also. This is an example of a bad uh, test. Um, um, well, actually, not not a, not a test. It's um. Uh, it's, a, it's a class, I called it left pad, haha, um, um, and it has three dimensions. It has the outer dimension, the class, the middle dimension, the method, and the inner dimension, the three different paths for, uh, for input. First is null comes in, we return null. Second, um, second is um, the string is already long enough, we don't need to pad anything, we return uh, the original string. And the third is good input and we actually do the processing. And so in, um, if we did this badly, then we would just write one method that, um, that calls uh, all three of them and, um, and just does, does the, the, the null check here and um, uh, checks for the other two in, in one occasion. Uh, you, you could argue this is okay, works for me. The problem is basically if any of those changes, uh, then the entire test breaks. And so that means the, um, the, the other concerns also, also break. And that's um, not uh, what we, um, the, uh, that's a violation of the single responsibility principle. The open-close principle says software entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Uh, this comes from a time um, when that actually meant um, uh, uh, that that principle originally was about the accessibility of source code. That's not um, what people talk about these days when um, when uh, they talk about the open close principle. These days, it's about um, 
I don't know if you've read Effective Java by Joshua uh, Block, it tells you um, design your class for extension or prohibit extension. One, of, one or the other. Don't go for ac accidental inheritance. Um, and so um, there are some cases when um, I've seen people have the production class and create an extension of that production class in their test uh, where they overwrite some significant uh, methods. And that, in my opinion, is a violation of the open close principle. That's not, um, if, if your class is, um, uh, supports inheritance, then it should have a good reason and that good reason should not be because it needs to be tested. Then um, your tests uh, should not um, force you to um, uh, do um, use bad design decisions in your production class. So this is an anti-pattern subclasses for tests. Um, the next anti-pattern is actually making package protected access. This is arguable. I wouldn't say, uh, so this is a strong anti-pattern. This is a weak anti-pattern. I actually do that sometimes myself, but um, so uh, making a method package protected because the, um, the test class is in the same package, I can just call the, uh, the method even though it's not publicly accessible, so the, t uh, the test has special access. I don't know, it's not perfect, but sometimes it's an acceptable workaround. Better would be um, use clean abstractions and use um, um, actually separate concerns, use mock objects, and that mock, mock objects can do exactly what you need. So here's my tightly coupled class. My tightly coupled class um, uh, has, um, has a service that's actually hard coded with, uh, with, with new and it just, um, and in my test I actually override this, this foo method uh, hard coding bas. And this is of course a worthless test. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't test anything. The only thing it tests is, is that uh, one part of the test uh, knows what the other part of the test does. So that, that's pretty much um, what we wanted to avoid. Um, so instead, we can um, say we'll, uh, we'll inject the service here and, um, um, it, and then um, so use a constructor injection um, here and then we can use Mokito um, and insert the service, tell the service what to do and then this is, this is a lot less uh, messy. The Liskov substitution principle um, applies to objects uh, inheritance. Um, so basically it means um, that um, anything that applies to a superclass should also be applicable to any, uh, any subclass. Um, that means that, uh, I mean in Java for example, it means that any method that accepts a collection as a parameter, uh, you can actually um, uh, call that method with an array list as a parameter because an array list actually implements a collection. And so in Java this applies to both class and interfaces. Um, and so um, when you actually design class hierarchies, um, usually it's a good idea to def design corresponding test class hierarchies. Some of you may now have alarm bells ringing in their uh, head, and that's a good thing. Um, uh, if you're saying, um, well, uh, isn't test class hierarchies over engineering? And I said, yeah, perhaps it is, but um, on the other hand, Having class hierarchies is usually also over-engineering, so you want to keep the over-engineering um, on, the, on the same level on both sides. You actually want, um, want your um, tests to work on the appropriate abstraction level for, for your production class, and that often means that you, you have um, a similar level of hierarchy there. And um, another thing is, if the classes ha all have a common contract, the classes in a hierarchy, then the, the same should probably be true for, um, for test classes. Um, so, for example, um, collection implementations. Let's, uh, let's say um, linked list and array list have the same contract. It's a list, it, uh, it provides positional access, it will keep, uh, keep insertion order, etc. And uh, you'd write the same kind of test for it. You could write an abstract list test, actually, ArrayList and linked list both 
extend from an abstract list class. So you could write an abstract list test, and then um, uh, which which contains all the test methods. And in the implementation for linked lists or the implementation for array list, you'd probably just have one method that actually instantiates uh, um, uh, the list, and then you've um, um, you've use the list kind of substitution principle and you've saved yourself a lot of code. Um, so this is, this is how we, we do it uh, sketched. Here you have an abstract collection test and there'd be, there'd be some tests in here, of course. Uh, that, um, and, um, so, and it would have an abstract method that creates the test and we would um, uh, actually say array list uh, test extends abstract collection test and probably there should be a generic parameter here for array list and here uh, for hash set test there would, should be a generic parameter here for hash set and we would just instantiate it and everything else would happen up here. The interface segregation principle says many client specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. Now these days people are all talking about um, getting rid of monoliths. This applies to interfaces also. I have been guilty of this in the past also and most experienced developers have been guilty of that. I've seen interfaces with 20 methods. Don't do it. Spe again, special case for things like collections. I mean, those we all don't write collection interfaces, at least most of the time we don't, but um, uh, most of those methods in the collection interfaces are valid. But if we write a service interface, it should, should probably have something between one and five methods. Um, and um, if we actually, um, if, one, if a class implements multiple interfaces, then those are several different concerns of the class and those different concerns should probably be um, tested separately. And there's different ways to do that, but, uh, but yeah, so this slide is a bit shorter. Um, but one way that I'm suggesting is, so if I have a class that implements foobal and barbel, um, then, uh, then actually there's an abstract foobal test and an abstract barbel test because there may be other foobals and other barbels. And um, I do the fo uh, multi multitests, which, um, which is foobal is the interface, multi is the implementation class. There I test the, as the foobal aspect of this class and in the barbel I test the barbel aspect of this class. I'm not saying you have to do it that way, but I think it's an, uh, it, it, it keeps concerns uh, separated. The dependency inversion principle says, depend upon abstractions, do not depend upon concretions. Um, yeah, so basically you should deal with the public facade of your class and not uh, with the internal details. Um, and for that reason you should always test public methods and not implementation details. Try to test on the same level of abstraction as the implementation and don't change internal state. I'll actually show you some examples later on in the talk where I will violate that principle, but um, at least you have to have principles first before, uh, in order to violate them. So here's uh, the bad example. Here's a test that um, uh, adds something to an array list and then actually accesses the internal field to, uh, to verify that the element is there. Don't do it that way, please. Okay, let's um, actually start with um, JUnit. JUnit out of the box. Um, has its own assertion me uh, uh, mechanism. So you have these classic assertions, assert not null, assert equals, assert not equals, etc. Um, everybody uses them when they're starting, but in the end they're not really that helpful. In this case I'm doing three different assertions on this list and depending on what actually is going on in this list I'll get this kind of output. If it's just like this, I'll get an assertion, uh, assertion error for the, for the assert non null. Um, there's no message whatsoever. Um, if I initialize it to an empty list, I'll get an expected zero actual what, one, which also tells me nothing. And this, um, this third part uh, tells me values should be different. Um, okay, so again, to recall what was I, uh, checking for. Um, so yeah, I basically wanted to have one non-empty string and that's none of this output tells me anything about that. Um, so 
what I would suggest to use there is Hamcrest actually. Um, Hamcrest is a library that um, uh, creates custom matchers. It brings along lots of uh, predefined matchers, but it also lets you um, uh, define your own matchers. And a matcher um, helps you make the tests more readable, so it's more like a DSL. It actually reads like a, um, like, uh, a real statement. And it also has readable output, which is also very va uh, valid, because usually you don't have the class at hand. Usually you, um, you have a build, and on, on the build you, you read a test failure, and you actually want to, want to read a message and know what's going on there. And um, yeah, and with Hamcrest you usually want to uh, work on the correct abstraction level. Um, there's builder matchers, and you can uh, extend them with your own. So here's the same test, um, rewritten with Hamcrest matches. You see there's one assertion less. Um, that's actually not perfect. Uh, we could reduce that down to one assert, but um, I chose not to over-engineer it. Here, first I'm um, asserting that this list has the size one, and that includes the check that it's not null. That's implicit. And, um, and that it has one item which is a non-empty string. And the non-empty string is my own custom matcher, the others are built in. Here's my custom matcher. I create a type save matcher. Um, here's, the, here's the matching. I do a trimming and assert that it's not empty. Um, and here I uh, provide the readable description. Um, and um, so now our error messages are getting slightly better. I expected a collection with size one, but I got no. I expected a collection with size one, but got a collection with size zero. And I expected a collection containing a non-empty string, but I got this. This is a bit. Okay, now we need to talk about abstraction. Um, abs abstraction is um, something that you have to be very careful about uh, in programming languages like Java because you can have too little of it or too much of it and both are bad. Um, so basically there's two kinds. There's the, uh, the one that, that's called stringly typed where you use, use primitive data structures to model your entire application. You'll have magic strings all over the place. And um, then on the other hand, you have the so-called baklava code, which has many, 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 many layers of abstractions. And both of them are um, really bad. So in the, in the stringly typed, your tests uh, will probably have to have custom knowledge of what those strings are made of, and probably your tests need to parse some, some strings, etc. And in the uh, baklava code, your tests will probably have to do a lot of setting up of multiple dependency layers, etc. Both of them are probably not what, uh, what you want. So even if you design uh, matchers, you want to do it on the right abstraction level. One example is JSON. Um, these days, JSON is a standard uh, for web APIs. Um, and so um, we'll have lots of code that actually deals with JSON, that returns JSON. And of course, we want to test that. but. Um, how can we, uh, we, we test JSON output? There's several ways we can do it, and we'll start with the most um, obvious way, which is doing string assertions. So I have a JSON string, and I obviously I wouldn't get it hard-coded, it would come from somewhere, but here I'm doing an assert equals, and it will break. Can anybody see it? Yep, there's a space missing here, that's here. Which means, from a JSON point of view, these strings are completely equivalent, um, but still the test would break, and it would break in a very nonsensical way. So I could slightly improve this um, by using regex. I could go for this crazy thing, I'll try to, uh, to implement my own JSON parser on the fly. It's actually, I think this, this, this test even, uh, even is uh, even green, but still you can uh, see it's very flaky, so um, I have to think of all grammar edge cases um, and I have to um, think of, yeah, and property reordering would, would also break the test even though the JSON is still um, uh, semantically equivalent. So um, that's definitely also not what I want. 
What I could do is I could um, use a JSON parser and just do it manually. I'll use Jackson in this case and, um, and read the JSON tree and then do assertions on the JSON tree. But this basically puts me on the same abstraction level that I had earlier in my, um, in, in, in my uh, um, plain J unit assertions. Um, so I'll get, potentially I could get some, some um, exceptions here if this can't be converted to int and uh, the, the messages I get won't be very um, readable, etc. So it, it would be a lot uh, better to have uh, something that actually understands JSON from a testing perspective. And um, that's where JSON path comes in. So the JSON path assert um, is actually um, an extension to, to JSON path, which does pretty much the same thing that XPath does with XML. So it provides uh, you with path expression, etc. And JSON path actually combines, uh, provides hamcrest matches for JSON paths. Um, and um, it lets you um, uh, write much nicer assertions. So you just say, okay, give me an assert with JSON and assert that this path has this value and this path has that value. This will, uh, it, you have the implicit syntax checking, you have, um, um, you have the implicit type conversions, etc. everything done under the hood. And if anything is wrong, you'll get the appropriate level of error messages because there's a framework behind that that specializes on doing this. Okay, so ideally, if there's a framework that already does my work, then I'll use the framework and not reinvent the, the wheel. And so uh, JSON assert is um, one uh, tool that's very nice for that kind of, kind of situation. Um, so basically, look for existing matcher libraries that fit your use case, and um, write your. If you have to write your own matchers, that's not a problem. Write them, but try to write them in a reusable way. Um, always use a factory method. Go with a just just a local factory method. If you, um, okay, if you um, uh, see that you um, you. Thanks. Um, that you're gonna have to um, reuse it in the same project, just move it to a helper class, probably with a descriptive name. And if you, well, but if you then realize, okay, it's uh, actually useful in more than one project, then you might actually want to um, uh, create your own matcher library that, um, that you distribute internally. Okay, next, mocking. This is actually from a pretty good um, a presentation about mocking. So mocking first, I mean the word, word mocking means making fun of people or imitating uh, something badly sometimes. And mocking is of course, um, is of course um, a methodology where uh, you replace a potentially complex object or object tree with, um, with um, a cheap replacement that you set up in your test. And there's different ways of doing it. Um, one way is what I mentioned earlier, overriding methods of the original class. Another way is if it's an interface, just providing your own interface uh, implementation. Um, and the third one is creating a proxy. And so if it's an, um, an interface, then you can use um, uh, plain Java um, JDK proxies, um, write an inv invocation handler, etc. And if it's a class, then you'll have to um, use a, a bytecode modification library, something like cglib or bytebuddy, etc. Um, but all of that is a bit messy. Um, if we recall solid again, then Overriding methods of the original class uh, violates the open close principle. We've established that. Providing an alternative interface implementation implementation violates interface segregation principle because actually this interface could have lots of other methods. Potentially, we'll have to write many um, uh, methods in our test, even though we only want to test one of them. And creating a proxy is um, this this is um, it uh, violates um, the dependency inversion principle. Um, so this is where dedicated mocking framework come, uh, comes in. There's several others, but 
Personally, I only like Mojito, so I'll go with this one. Um, so again, Mojito deals with all the down and dirties. Mojito will do the proxying for you. You don't have to deal with it on that abstraction level. And so here we'll have a look at what we want to test. So here, there's, a, there's an interface, and uh, actually two interfaces, um, and a login service uh, uses this user service and returns um, and um, here, there, the, an interface is returned, and this one does uh, the, the login check based on the return of this, this other service. So when we test this, we actually need to deal with two different interfaces, with, uh, with the user service interface and with the session interface. So we could do this without Mojito because this is a, a, a one method interface. We can just use, um, use Lambdas in Java 8, and it's nice, we have a one-liner, that's pretty cool, and this is actually pretty readable. Um, and um, yeah, same here also. And um, the problem is, if this interface um, evolves, if login service gets new methods, I'm gonna have to touch all these tests. And I'm wondering why would I have to touch these tests? I didn't change anything uh, uh, regarding the login, I added new functionality. New function, adding new functionality shouldn't break old tests. So. That sucks. Um, also, yeah, I have, um, I, I can't actually set this guy up in a centralized place. I always have to do the setup in, in the tests. And I would argue that that's a cross-cutting concern that should be done in one place in the tests, not uh, in every single method. So here's how we would do it in Mojito. I have a user service field and a login service field, and in my setup method, I'd create a Mojito mock, and I'd call the constructor of the login service and pass in this mock. And now in my test, I, um, I actually can uh, specify behavior. When the user service um, uh, gets a login with any string, any string, then it should return an optional containing, again, a mock of a session. Because for this test, we just, we don't care what the session actually is. We just want to know that it's there, that it's, uh, that, uh, that it's not an empty optional. That's all we need for our test. And so we assert that this returns true. And then the nice thing is actually we do a verify. Um, we verify that um, the, uh, the underlying method was actually called on the, ma uh, on the mock because it could always be a false positive. It could always be some other reason why this suddenly returns true. We, we want to make sure that it re returns true for the right reason. Okay, so we have the common setup and we have no tight coupling uh, to user service and session and we can verify a mock interaction. But we have a bit more code here um, uh, as uh, com compared to the pr uh, previous one, which is not the case if the interface evolves. If the interface evolves, then this, this guy will stay, but the other um, method will grow exponentially. But there's some corner cases where perhaps you want to go with a, with a plain way without Mokita. With Mokita, you have some more advanced techniques. Um, yeah, first, first of all, you need to make, uh, make sure the um, difference, some, with some frameworks you have to record everything that you'll call. That's not the case with Mojito. Mojito um, mocks have default behavior. They'll basically um, apply the JDK default. Uh, wh uh, when, you just, when you create a field of a reference type, it's initialized to null unless you explicitly initialize it. And um, Mojito will go with all those default values um, and um, including for primitives. Um, so if you have a, if you mock a method that returns a boolean, it will return false unless you tell it otherwise. Um, in advanced cases, sometimes you actually want to mock an, an already existing object. That means um, then you'll actually say Mokito spy object, and then you record behavior uh, for that and do verifications on that. I try to avoid that. To me, it's, uh, it's a sign of a messy architecture, but it is a, uh, some, sometimes, especially with legacy code, there's no way around it. And sometimes um, you have to be more specific in what you want to return, and you want to programmatically specify what you want to return, and then you won't return the, um, 
then usually you go with then return, but in this case you would go with then answer, and um, uh, and answer is an interface or I answer is an interface that you can implement and then, um, and where you get the actual method parameters and you can interact with them. Um, and then there's a technique that we go into later, deep stubs, where you can uh, say if you if you have a a call graph in your code, then you actually don't want to mock the entire call graph. Mokita will do that for you, but I'll try to get to that later. Okay. Then, of course, there's the case where, I mean, these days we're dealing with lots of web APIs, and usually we want to mock them, and there's um, um, two ways we can do that. We can do it black box, where um, basically we, we, we have an API that behaves similar to the real API, so we just want to set something up um, that, uh, that answers to network calls. And um, there are tools like mock server or wiremock that do that. Or we can go white box, um, use the API's own code um, uh, to create mocks, and usually that happens without real network traffic. Then in that kind of scenario, um, the re request response objects are also mocked, uh, mocked away. So you're mocking um, the, the controller structure, but you're not actually doing network traffic. And an example of this is Spring's mock MVC. Um, so, here's an example of how you would set up mock server. In this case, this is an, something you do in an integration test. Um, you'd, you'd probably call it um, uh, in a before uh, uh, method or rule, and it would fire up a real, uh, real client that actually listens to requests. You'd um, call your production code that interacts um, the, um, that uh, that's interacts with that server. Do your assertions and then tear it down again in the um, in the after method. As opposed to that, um, if you go with something like Spring MVC, then this would be your controller. And um, and in, if we want to test this method, then we can we can go with this setup which is mock MVC builder standalone setup for a controller and we instantiate the controller with a mock and now we can actually do uh, perform a virtual request to a URL set headers and make assertions on the return type um, so status code is 200 content type is application JSON and we can actually verify that the structure um, contains this value that we set here um, uh, here above so that's a very nice uh, way of doing things what you're doing here is basically you're trusting the framework to take care of the technical bits um, so um, you're saying okay if this works then I trust the actual network real network collection uh, connection will also work Okay, looking at JUnit lifecycle. Um, the basic lifecycle is you have um, before and after methods where you can put code that runs before or after each individual test method. Um, that's good for yeah, setting up or cleaning up individual test data. And um, if you have more heavy lifting to do, then you have before class, after class. Uh, so that's where you could do something like um, bootstrapping a database or firing up a web server, etc. cetera. And, um, and of course, yeah, creating and deleting the temporary folders. Okay, um, this can suck if we need, uh, if we have many similar tests, then we basically have similar before and after methods in many different places. So we could say we move the setup to an abstract test class. We have an abstract test class that deals with the concerns. Um, let's say an abstract database integration test. I've actually been guilty of creating such. Um, but um, yeah, and we, we'd have we'd probably um, get some custom parameters from abstract methods uh, that each test class would have to implement, perhaps the database table, et cetera. Um, but here we have the problem um, that in some cases that, that works well, but in some technical uh, cases um, this won't work that well and it definitely violates this substitution principle. Um, 
because we don't have this kind of hierarchy probably on the production cloud. Perhaps you do have this kind of, of hierarchy, but you, you probably shouldn't have that kind of, uh, kind of hierarchy. Okay, but so how can we reuse our code without using inheritance? Um, of course, there's the, there's a, the extreme version to write our own JUnit runner. Um, which basically gives us, uh, so we use this run with annotation and we replace the entire JUnit workflow with our own custom workflow. That gives us full control over the entire life cycle, but it's also a huge pain. Um, so some people did that and some of you have probably used some of these runners. I mean, there's the Spring JUnit Forerunner, which actually ties the JUnit life cycle to the Spring life cycle. It does dependency injection, transaction handling, and some other cool stuff. And there's the Mokito runner, which basically injects uh, Mokito mocks in all fields that are annotated with mock, which is very nice. And then there's the parameterized runner for um, uh, parameter, um, parameterized tests. Um, and here's an example of the parameterized runner. Here um, I actually test, uh, I have one test, but I want to te run this one test with many different parameters. And here I built a set of parameters. And what this parameterized runner does, it will actually create uh, a, a two-dimensional test. So for this test, it will create an instance for each of those um, parameter sets. Um, and so you will actually see, uh, okay, this test succeeds, succeeds with this value, but it fails with this value, etc. And so that's, that's kind of handy. Um, but the problem is um, the values are common for all test methods. So if you have one test here that needs one set of parameters and, um, and another test that needs another set of parameters, you're screwed. It won't work. Drawbacks with uh, runners, yes, there can only be one. You can't mix runners. This is a huge pain for a lot of people that you can't mix the spring runner and the Mokita runner, um, or spring runner and parameterized runner, for example, and it's a very, very technical interface. That's not the kind of um, level you should have to deal with uh, when, you, when you write tests. Um, and as I said, you have to do everything. So let's look at rules. Um, a rule is a component that you can introduce. It's just an object that you instantiate and that um, implements an interface, and it's marked with a rule annotation. If it's there, JUnit will pick it up, and it will um, actually, for each test call, it would f will first call the rule, and then the, if the rule delegates to the test, it will uh, um, call the test. Uh, so you're basically giving the, the, the power to the rule. Rules can interact with the test lifecycle. They could, even if they're nasty, completely not do the, um, uh, execute the test at all. Um, there's two kinds. There's, a, um, there's the, uh, the rule and the class rule, and the only difference is, um, is the annotation you use. The abstraction is actually the same. So um, here's a rule that um, executes a test n times and actually logs the entire duration. Just well, I don't know if that's useful, but um, just as an example. Um, so here um, you return a statement, and in here you actually base evaluate. Actually, this is this is the original uh, statement. Here you actually execute the test, and we execute it uh, n times, and we record um, the time. Okay. So looking at the life cycle. If you just need specific setup, use before or after. Use rules if you want to um, reuse custom setup logic, or use custom runners for parameterized testing or spring, or usually you, you shouldn't write your own custom runner. Okay, but we said we wanted to talk about Scala. Um, in Scala, things are a bit differently, uh, different. Um, there's um, the main, uh, the, the framework I'll be talking about mostly is called Scala Test. Um, Scala Test supports testing in many different styles. As looking at JUnit, there's only one testing style. You have a class, a test class with test methods that have the annotation test. Those are JUnit tests. Um, with Scala Test, there's many different ways um, 
as you can uh, create tests, but one thing they have in common is you always do it programmatically. It's not you write a method and reflection happens and picks up the method, you actually programmatically instantiate the test. Um, you do that through DSLs. Uh, there's several different functional, uh, different, different styles there, and everybody has their own favorite, and there's a custom matcher API also. The alternative I want to mention, because the developer actually works for us, for Zalando, is Spec2. It's also a nice framework, but it happens to not be my favorite, so I will be talking about Scala Test anyway. Um, in Scala Test, this is a very simple example. You actually, um, here you can see, um, we extend flat spec, which basically means we will go with this type of building tests and we extend it uh, with matchers. Um, extending flat uh, spec uh, will mean that we define a, t a test like this. Uh, we, we define the scope of the test and then we uh, define what it should do and with this in we uh, define the actual test. So, um, and here we make some assertions and here we're using these matchers. And so we have one test here and one test here. Which is of course kind of cool, but it's also um, a bit um, tricky uh, when you come from a JUnit perspective because in Java, tests are completely isolated methods and yeah, there's the two levels of nesting. In Scala, they're not isolated. It's one programmatically a creation of tests and if you screw up in the first line, then all your tests are broken. So that's something you have to get used to. Um, and you can have arbitrary levels of nesting, so, and the different ways to direct tests. So here's, not saying you should do it that way, but if you actually write a test that way, you have, for each of those, you're creating a new level of nesting, and you'll actually see that on the output. You'll actually see it indented like, uh, like this. Uh, and so, with less structuring, you can actually get very nice formatted output of your tests but um, this is definitely taking it too far. And so this is what success looks like and this is what failure looks like. Implementing matchers is a bit different from Hamcrest. First of all, you don't, um, uh, um, you just um, extend the matchers trait. So with Scala you have kind of multiple inheritance through traits uh, which are uh, interfaces with implementations. Um, now you'll say Java has that also. No, it doesn't. Um, Java is moving in that direction, but it's not there yet. Um, so, and in uh, and matchers enable readable assertions with the should keyword. If you don't like the should keyword, there's an alternative flavor that uses the must keyword. But apart from that, they're the same. And here are some some example matcher uh, matcher statements. Result should have length three. This is an actual assertion. Or file should have name ten. And this uh, tick um, will actually tell. Uh, tell the um, uh, test framework to look at the name property of the file object. So it's a bit hacky, but kind of cool. Okay, here's a custom matcher um, matching for an extension, and we have um, and we have a, um, um, a factory method to, uh, to use it. Okay, so the, ne the the really cool thing that you can do in um, in Scala and actually in most functional languages is property testing. That is, if you go with pure functional programming, then your method has an input and an output and no side effects. And if you can, um, well, if your input is, for example, an integer, then you want to make sure that, um, that your uh, code is valid for the entire pro problem domain, so for all integers. And um, Scala Check is a tool that will actually help you do that. First of all, it will help you with data generation, so it can, for example, throw all integers at your, um, at your t uh, test code, and if it finds an error, it, it's also good in finding the, the narrowest error case. So, um, if, uh, so, so basically the, the closest integer um, that, that will let your test break. Uh, that's a very handy thing to have. Okay, and so here's one thing, here's um, 
let's we have, we have a fraction class this this just just it generates a, it has a numerator and a denominator and um Here's a test that actually um, uh, uh, tests the correct behavior for this fraction class. So here we generate all, uh, all integers, but we exclu exclude bad values. We exclude values uh, with min, integer min value, or for the denominator we exclude zero. But on the other hand, we want to handle those. And in the next screen, we have an explicit table where we um, say, okay, these are all the bad values we can think of. And we assert that for all of these invalids, um, it creates an illegal argument exception. And that's a very nice and handy thing. Okay, so here's a bit of a comparison of how to do things in Java and Scala. In, um, um, in JUnit, you use Hamcrest matchers, and Scala test mix in matcher traits. Um, before or after lifecycle stuff are things you actually do in code in Scala test. Um, you, um, Reusable code that you would put in a rule, you would put in a trait, and uh, instead of parameterized running, you would go with property testing. And yeah, we're, we're already way out of time, probably. Um, so Java and Scala can be uh, can be combined in one project. You can have production code in Java tests in Scala. You can have production code in both Java and Scala. That's not the scope. Five minutes. Okay, that's not the scope of this talk, so I won't go into it. Um, so if you don't like Scala, then JUnit 4 is all, also pretty cool. We've, we've seen some of it. And JUnit 5 will come soon and it will have some new cool features. There will be a, a new test uh, callback mechanism. You will be able to test, uh, to create tests dynamically, but not as dynamically as in Scala. Um, and it will have Lambda support in assertions, which is very nice. Um, but I promised you to test the untestable, and so let's look at what makes software untestable. Shared static state, lack of visibility, or a deep dependence, dependency tree. And so this is the first part is um, when I came to Zalando, Zalando used the um, Stripes framework, which is kind of a leaner version of Struts. And it was a pretty cool framework some eight or nine years ago, but uh, the problem it badly. Um, so the, the problem was uh, Stripes relies on static initialization in a servlet filter, and every aspect of Stripes that you may want to test uses methods that rely on this state. So, and if you integrate Spring into it, then it gets even worse because it uses this method to get at Spring Beans, um, uh, which is. Uh, basically, I mean, you, Spring uses the inversion of control, but what I call this pattern is the inversion of inversion of control because it's actually um, uh, service locator and not um, um, and not inversion of control. So, how can I solve this? I uh, created solutions for Stripe and uh, Stripes and Spring separately, and um, I wrote tests. Um, yeah, I had to make make sure that. Because I'm dealing with static state, I had to, whenever I um, set something up, I had to make sure I tear it down at the end of the test because otherwise I would be polluting other tests. And um, try to keep low level hacks in one isolated place. Don't pollute your tests with low level hacks. Use uh, friendly facades for that. So that led me to writing classes like this. This is actual real code you'll find in Zalando code base. Uh, and um, uh, here, so here I'm actually setting up uh, the stripes filter, putting it in a um, in a static, and this, this this stripes filter will do its static madness. And um, I have uh, and I have to call the destroy afterwards and null it out and everything. And this is really it's a real pain, but it made me actually able to test stripes actions. Okay, and I had to do the pretty much the same thing with Spring. I had to create a method register bean, which would create shared static state. And this test class is also this is actually a lot longer than this screen, but I'll spare you the rest. Um, sometimes you have to be really evil and hacky, but try to do it in only in one place. The other part is oh, I'll be I'm almost gone. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> 
The, the other part is um, visibility. If you control this, um, if something is not visible, um, then if you control the sources, try to just make it visible. But otherwise, you probably have to use reflection, but don't use reflection in your tests. Build high-level facades. That's a bit what I did earlier. Here's one case where I did that recently. Um, Antler is a parser generator, and um, which you feed with a grammar, and it creates a parser for you. And a parser like that um, consists of many grammar rules that are implemented as separate methods that are protected. And if you want to test those methods, then um, you're going to have to call them with reflection. And I used a setup like this to actually create uh, tests for parser rules and um, used uh, files with a special naming convention. And I created the test dynamically with Scala tests, which looked something like this. It did look a little cleaner, but I had to fit it on the slides. Um, yeah. Third part is deep dependency tree, and there the solution is actually, so the problem here is the law of Demeter, which says a method should only be um, uh, allowed to deal with these objects, so objects it knows, and not foo.getbar.getbuzz.get .get .get blah blah blah. And, but if you have a case like that, again, this is actual production code, um, and um, what you can use is Mokito's deep stubbing technique, which will look something like this. Here I create, uh, create a mock of this class, and I tell it return deep stubs, and then suddenly I can just do, I can just do, uh, just uh, record behavior for the entire call tree, and I don't have to go through the trouble of creating this mock, and this mock, and this mock, and this mock separately. That's a very nice feature for dealing, okay, yeah. Um, so. No time for questions, ask me after the talk, okay?